Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome and thank you for joining the British Chambers of Commerce uh, webinar on Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, my name is Marilise Salvini. I'm based at the London Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the 52 accredited chambers here in the UK. And the British Chambers of Commerce have asked me to chair this webinar on Central and Eastern Europe. So I'll be very quick and give you a quick introduction uh, to the session before handing over to our speakers who are on the ground in British Chambers of Commerce in Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Romania and Poland with us now. Uh, so, over the next 45 minutes, we'll be looking at uh, the Central and Eastern Europe region. Uh, so, we'll get a glimpse of the region, followed by some uh, brief market overviews and insights from our experts on the ground uh, before moving on to a Q&A session. The British Chambers of Commerce work with um, Chambers of Commerce, British Chambers of Commerce based overseas. Um, today, we've got uh, Chris Plant at the British Chamber of Commerce in uh, the Slovak Republic online. We've also got Paddy Ney uh, from the British Polish Chamber of Commerce, Christina Nguranu from the British Romanian Chamber of Commerce, and Philip Franek from uh, the Czech Republic online. There will be a Q&A session at the end, uh, but you are able to ask a question at any point using the control panel uh, on your screens. And uh, just to say, don't worry about taking notes. This is a recorded webinar. It will be available on the YouTube channel shortly. Uh, so there we go. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Chris for the regional overview. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Very nice indeed. Great to see you there. Um, so let's have a look at the first slide today. Obviously, this is a great um, little bit of introduction on CE today, and uh, myself and my colleagues are going to try and give you an overview of what we're talking about here. But if we start off with why would you be choosing as a British business Central and Eastern Europe, I think it's quite interesting to look at. So first of all, the region's combined GDP is over one trillion pounds. Um, and as you can read by the first bullet point there, you know, we have over 100 million people in the region. So that's almost twice as many as in the UK. From a locality perspective, you have to understand that the sea is only really two to three hours away from the, from the UK. Um, we're serviced by a very large number of budget airlines, so that means it's ideal for medium businesses, medium-sized businesses, especially on tight budgets. Um, we have an annual growth across the CEE, which is around 2.6% over the last five years. And if you compare that to the Eurozone, which is only 0.5%, and the UK only 0.2%, you'll see that it's quite favourable. Uh, we've got low, very low levels of public debt in the CEE, and obviously that ensures uh, economic stability, and that result, results in long-term long sustainable growth. And I think if we look at the fact that between 2014 and 2020, the region can benefit from over 125 billion euros, or pounds even, in EU funding, it shows that we're really um, pushing the boat out. Um, strong English language competence across the region makes a really great add-on for most British companies. And as we've, we've said quite often, the British brand is still very well liked and very well respected across the CE. So that means there's a really strong demand from local distributors for innovative and value-added British products. Let's have a look at the next slide now, please, Marilise, so if we can just pop onto that. That's great. So um, if we're looking at, obviously, the, the geographical territory there, you can see um, good old Great Britain there in the top left-hand corner. Um, and if you look over to the right, obviously, the CE uh, comes from, since the collapse of the Iron Curtain, 1989, 1990, that's where the name comes from. And obviously, CE refers to Central and Eastern Europe. Um, you can look over there that, uh, just, up, just below uh, England, obviously, is France. To the right, you'll see Germany. And then if we start looking at these sort of shaded colors, you can see right at the top there is Poland. Just underneath, uh, on the left-hand side, is Czech Republic, followed underneath there by Slovakia. So that's the old Czechoslovakia. Then directly underneath Slovakia, you have Hungary. To the left is a smaller market of Slovenia. And then over to the right, again, another large market like Poland, Romania. So you can see that we're pretty close to home, really. So let's, let's just move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about some stats now. So if we look at these two graphs, if you start off with the left-hand graph, you can see that the orange columns, or the, the yellowy kind of color columns on the left graph, are the EU3 countries. That's Italy, France, and Germany. Um, and this is an average GDP score for exports from 
those countries into the certain countries that you see there. And if you look at the red columns, you'll see that that's UK exports, so imports into the CEE. And if you have a look at the first one, for instance, Poland, you can see that as a UK, we, we only export under half as much as the EU3 countries uh, exporting out of the UK. So looking along that graph there, you can see the massive opportunities for British business. You look at Romania, Slovakia, you can see that there's only a quarter of exports from Britain going out. And if you look at Slovenia, there's hardly any at all there. So it's a really comprehensive overview that we can see exactly that British export has a great opportunity to, to go forward. On the right-hand graph, you'll see that the GDP growth forecast in the CE. If you look at the red columns there on the right-hand graph, you'll see um, if you look at the average of the uh, GDP growth in the CE area, you can see that we're on around sort of 3%, just over 3% as an average. And if you compare that, as we mentioned before, to the blue column, which is the Eurozone, you can see that that's only 1.5%. Now, obviously, if you compare that to the green columns on the right-hand side, which are the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, you can see that um, you know, they're around 4%, so obviously a little bit better GDP growth, but obviously on that um, sort of area, you're looking to see that um, it's probably a little bit further away, logistical problems, you know, we, we like to think that you're a bit better off coming to the CE, so there's a lot more higher risk in the BRIC countries. So I think that gives you a really good overview of where we are. So that's our introduction today. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Philip Franek, who's the Senior Trade Consultant in the British Chamber of Commerce in the Czech Republic. So please, Philip. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to some uh, challenges and issues uh, while trading to the Central and Eastern Europe and the way to overcome them. Obviously, uh, you can easily avoid these issues by uh, sourcing support from the British Chambers of Commerce and the British Business Centers. So the first issue is to be aware of the local currencies. It's only Slovakia and Slovenia which are part of the Eurozone, while all the other countries trade in their uh, local national currencies at the moment. Chris already mentioned that English is uh, widely spoken within the region, uh, but uh, don't expect that everybody uh, in, in your customer's company will speak English, especially when you need to start dealing with the technical level guys. They are more likely to be fluent in German than English. Uh, there are cultural differences to be aware of in each of our markets. The general difference is that business is slightly more formal than in the UK, so do not expect a first name basis uh, during your first meeting, for example. And obviously make sure to get good legal advice, uh, as it should be the case in any export market. Uh, now on the next slide. Uh, so. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, you can see a few photos of a uh, typical British business center to imagine what it looks like. It's a practical physical space where you can plug in and go. Uh, it offers you temporary office with some hot desking, possibility to uh, lease a meeting room, a board room, and in general, it uh, showcases the British business in the particular country and city where we are present. On the next slide, uh, you will see the uh, results of, of the first year. So we organized as a, as a Region 11 trade delegation over 50 OMIS type, of proje OMIS type projects, uh, 10 product launches, uh, and uh, we helped uh, over 2,000 companies from Great Britain. Obviously, we are focusing on uh, quality of our uh, support, and we try to provide the best value to UK exporters. And now I will hand over to uh, Patrick Ney, who is the director of the uh, trade team in Poland, who will talk in more detail about the uh, 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 support and services that we offer to British exporters. Thanks very much, Philip. And uh, I hope so far the presentation has been useful. As Philip says, uh, what we're trying to do is give you a brief overview here of a relatively homogenous region uh, with many similarities between them, which is why we are a partnership working together. We're Chambers of Commerce, as Philip has outlined, but we work in partnership with UKTI. That means that in every single market which Chris has outlined, you've got an embassy with the UK Trade and Investment Team working to support big ticket companies and high value opportunities in campaign sectors. Working in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce Trade Team or Business Centre that's working to help small and medium companies across a wide range of sectors. As part of this new project that we've launched with UK Trade and Investment and the British Chambers of Commerce, each of our markets is currently undergoing a pretty extensive accreditation process by the BCC. 
So they've been coming in and looking at our governance, our finance, and our services, and making sure that British companies are able to deal with credible international organizations. So what is it we do? Well, put simply, uh, we are focused on finding the right B2B solutions. We're looking to identify for you wholesalers, distributors, agents, partners, people that can grow your business in this market. And crucially, we want to move beyond the stocking or your, your stock uh, to selling and marketing and growing your brand in these markets, not just in one country, but around the region. So it's a really exciting partnership between uh, UKTI government organizations and B2B networks, chambers of commerce. We, in fact, we realized the other day that between us, between these markets, we have over a thousand Chamber of Commerce members, and that's a really powerful symbol, I think, of the, uh, the potential out there in the B2B networks that we can harness. So in terms of what we do, well, much of the support and the advice uh, and the questions that we answer, just like UK Trade and Investment, uh, is free. However, for complex market entry projects, when we're looking to really bring a company into market, when we're looking to deliver specific bespoke support for them that can help bring their brand or or introduce new products into the country or into a region, uh, then we'll do a, a paid project just like UK Trade and Investment would. It's a question we always get asked at events. I was with uh, Chris and the team uh, just last week in Worcester. Typically our projects last between three and nine months, although that's no golden rule. Sometimes they can be upwards of two to three years, sometimes three weeks. Uh, we charge, as I say, uh, for complex projects at a rate of £42 an hour. That's a subsidised rate, subsidised by UKTI. It's the result of the project and agreement that we have with them. And typically for a new to market exporter that's looking for a range of support from identifying the right people, analyzing the target market, support with the logistics, and then support with growing their brands. These kind of projects can cost between 500 and 5,000 pounds. But as I say, what we're looking to do is support exporters just like UKTI does. And that means that we do an awful lot of support for companies, whether it's accessing our chamber member network, or finding the right name or telephone number of somebody in the government ministry, for example, as quickly as we can, uh, and usually free of charge. Next slide, please. Now, what we like to do is focus on companies that succeed. And sometimes, uh, when we're doing this presentation, sometimes it feels like we're teaching companies to suck eggs, but we do see companies make mistakes when they come out into market. And we want to help companies understand where the pitfalls are, uh, in advance so that they can think about them before they come out. And I always recommend if you don't already have one, uh, to get in touch with your, your local UK Trade Investment Office. They'll give you an international trade advisor, a business expert who's usually got business experience within your sector, who's helping other companies within your sector, within your region, uh, to internationalize. And there's a huge amount of support that the UK government uh, and chambers of commerce right up and down the country, uh, wherever you are in the UK, make available for exporters to get them ready to sell internationally. And when companies do in sell internationally, the companies uh, that we see selling and really succeeding have these characteristics. Of course, most importantly, uh, they've got the right products or services. They've got a budget. Obviously, it's really important to understand that along the way when you come into the market, you're going to be looking for expert support, whether it's our support for market research, analysis, uh, market entry, or whether it's the support of a translation company to make sure that the labeling on your products is absolutely spot on and complies with the local and EU standards in that local language. Budget's obviously crucial. Not every company uh, has a huge budget. That's fine. Uh, but making sure that you understand exactly what that is before you go into your market entry process can save you a lot of headache later on. Companies that succeed have a team. It doesn't need to be someone dedicated or a group of people, uh, but very often we can see smaller companies struggle with uh, demands on their product line at the same time as an HR issue, at the same time as trying to grow their brand internationally. So if you've got a smaller team, think about entering a smaller, uh, lower risk market. And we think our markets are relatively lower risk when you compare them to the distance and challenges, say, of the Chinese market. But making sure that you've got a team dedicated to your market export, uh, regardless of the size of your business, we think is absolutely crucial. Having experience is obviously vital as well, uh, and for many companies taking their first steps abroad internationally is a big, big uh, challenge and not one that we underestimate. So companies that succeed generally do tend to have the experience of exporting, but if you don't, it's not a barrier. It just means that you need a bit of extra support uh, from your local Chamber of Commerce, UK Trade Investment Advisor, and your International Chamber of Commerce too. Strategy is absolutely crucial. You've got to understand what are your products and services, who are the end users that are looking to buy them, and how are you going to get there. Companies that don't have a strategy obviously fail. Uh, companies that do uh, still need to be flexible, as I put there, uh, but, but generally they're the ones that succeed. And focus is absolutely crucial. I've got a company at the moment that I'm helping. Uh, they've got one export manager, which is great. 
and they're looking to export to a African market, a Middle Eastern market, and Poland at the same time. Those are three very different business cultures all at once, uh, and I think that the lack of focus for that particular company is hampering their, their market export strategy. Next slide, please. So we've talked about uh, companies that succeed and our services. I hope that was clear, but we're ready to answer any questions around Q&A. We put together this one slide, and I think Chris has already uh, given you a slice and a picture of the immense amount of change which is coming all across this region. This is a region absolutely in development, and that's driven hugely by EU uh, funding. You can see that in many of the sectors that are built here, uh, that are written down here. So without wanting to go into too much detail, these are very, very top line uh, uh, sectors in which companies have a lot of opportunity. We always say, though, uh, that you've still got to look at your strategy, your products and services before you can think about entering that market, and you've got to do the right research, not always for every single company, but we've got to make sure that we understand that those end users, uh, are they reaching your price point? Are they interested in your products? Do you require a rebrand? Uh, are you sure that you're pitching them at the right uh, age? Uh, and now, these sectors obviously are huge, big ones. Uh, so we advise you to come and speak to an expert, whether it's ourselves, your local UK trade and investment, uh, or a private company, to make sure you can understand what the true story of the growth is behind them. Next slide, please. So now what we're going to do over the course of the last few slides is just talk about some practical examples uh, from the region. So I'm going to give you this one, and this is a company I'm incredibly proud of, uh, Roman Showers. They're a great British brand. They're one of the UK's largest independent manufacturers of bathroom and shower products. Uh, 12 million pound turnover, so not a small company by any means, but a company that's got a really uh, exciting growth strategy. We met them at a UK trade and investment export event in 2013, so quite a while ago now. We've been working with them ever since to identify a viable distribution network uh, into Poland. Ultimately, I'm glad to say that we've, uh, we've managed to get a distributor who's got access to 100 plus salons across Poland. It's absolutely the right place where they need to be, not in the chain stores, but in those independent salons. Uh, and they've been rolling out ever since, and I'm pleased to say the sales have been coming through uh, steadily. And of course, more importantly than anything else, uh, Roman tell us that we've given them the best service they've ever received from any agency, government or otherwise. So I'm now going to hand back uh, to Philip Franek from the British Chamber of Commerce uh, in the Czech Republic, and he'll tell you about some success there. Thank you. Thank you, Pede. Uh, I would like to mention the two examples of case studies from the Czech Republic. Uh, the first one, uh, we worked with a company called Design Flooring. It's a UK supplier of uh, luxury vinyl flooring products. And they are already represented in the Czech market. They have a local distributor. And they felt that this is a good time to grow their presence in the market and make the market more aware of their products. So we organized a product launch event, uh, which was attended by uh, 90 key specifiers, including architects, designers, developers, and end users. And this event uh, helped to design flooring and to their Czech distributor to grow their presence and sales in the market and make themselves more visible in the market. The next slide, please. Uh, in this case, we worked with a uh, UK company specialist insulation, uh, who is a UK supplier of innovative uh, non-metal ducting products. Uh, they were relatively new to the Czech market. They already had some contacts, uh, but wanted to understand more about the, the opportunities, and especially the opportunities with larger companies. Uh, so we've done a, a program of uh, meeting appointments for them, and we managed to introduce them to the leading uh, developers, ME contractors, and ME consultants in the market. And uh, from their feedback, you can see what, what they thought of our service. And uh, I would like to say that, that in this particular case, we, we proved to be very effective when providing introductions to key contacts in the individual sectors and segments which would be fairly difficult for a UK SME to, to reach directly themselves. And uh, now we'll hand over to Chris back uh, in Slovakia for a few case studies from Slovak market. Thank you, Philip. Excellent. Uh, I think in general you've seen a couple of really good success stories and um, one of the most important things is obviously helping British business and putting different things together. So we give you a quick example of something we've, uh, we've seen in Slovakia here and obviously this is a product launch. So um, automotive in Slovakia is of pretty high interest so obviously we're very happy when we met this particular client, VMT Visual Management Technologies in the UK at a trade, a trade show. 
Um, so obviously we wanted to help them promote their business. So we were talking to them for a few months to see if we could actually bring them over here to Slovakia. So obviously this company is um, specializing on lean management in the quality control sector. Um, so what we did was we put together an idea of a business breakfast. So this is something you can do all the way across the region. It's pretty simple. Uh, we did the uh, entire marketing background. So we called a lot of Slovak businesses. They might be members of our chamber of commerce. They may be a member of another chamber of commerce, but definitely various businesses that would be really key and interested in this particular sector and obviously quality control management. Uh, we found about 25 to 30 companies to attend a uh, business breakfast. And VMT were, were able to demonstrate their knowledge, their know-how, and put their, their products in front of the Slovak businesses, which is really important for a British business to do. So what happened? Well, the result, first of all, brand recognition, and obviously a host of really good leads um, on the ground in the Slovak market here. And since then, obviously, you can see by uh, the case study there and the, uh, the feedback that we've actually managed to increase their sales as well. So something as simple as this can really help. And as Paddy said before, we have over a 1,000 members across our network. Um, and with each of those members, it, it, it gives you the opportunity to gain services if you need as a British business locally, but it also gives you that access on the ground for potential clients. So it's a really important idea. So can we pop onto the next slide, please, and we'll give you a second example. Great. So this is something that we've, uh, we've developed as a CEE regional project. This is the CEE business portal.eu. Um, the website's not up there, but we can obviously give you that later on to have a look. But you can find all the offices through this particular portal, and you can see the services. We'll gather all that information and also we'll be able to do that across the region too. So we'll gather all that information and we'll be able to create a mailing list from our portal and to be able to in the future help these companies to be able to find the distributors across the market. So it's a very interesting new procedure and a very interactive and proactive way of approaching new business. So those are just a couple of the ideas that we've, we've come uh, through till now. But what I'd like to do now is hand over to my colleague, Mr. Nungarano. Uh, in Romania, and she can finish up the presentation and give you a few more uh, cases. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I would like to present you now a success story from Romania. Um, uh, we uh, were happy to, to assist a UK company named uh, Suzer uh, in one of our first uh, projects uh, uh, starting uh, in April uh, last year. Uh, Sulzar Pumps uh, delivers uh, pumps uh, for demanding applications uh, in um, uh, sectors like oil, oil and gas, uh, uh, power and water. Uh, in their search for uh, outsourcing uh, specific steel parts in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, they uh, chose Romania and together with uh, the British Romanian Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, we um, identified six uh, steel manufacturers uh, um, in the country. We uh, arranged a program of uh, visits uh, to these companies and um, as a result of, um, of this project uh, starting with uh, this year, uh, Suzer um, identified the factories that uh, best suited uh, uh, their requirement and uh, has started producing uh, the technical components uh, in Romania, then shipping them to Suzer branches uh, in the UK and Germany. And uh, now we, um, thanks to, to this successful cooperation, uh, we move to the second stage um, uh, for other uh, steel parts, um, uh, some castings, uh, uh, and we are in charge now to find um, uh, boundaries uh, in Romania and to finish uh, this uh, second stage of the project. So now uh, to move um, uh, on the next slide, please. And I would like to summarize what my colleagues uh, said before. Why um, should you come to the British business centers uh, and chambers of commerce in the CE region? Um, in the first uh, um, time, uh, we are a accredited business network. 
Uh, we are in line with the British Chambers of Commerce in the United Kingdom. Uh, we are a credible organization um, delivering uh, the same quality of services and uh, OMIS reports. We are always uh, putting our clients first. Uh, uh, we are, um, uh, we, um, are listening uh, carefully uh, to his requirements. We are trying to understand uh, what uh, our client is looking for. Each uh, client uh, has uh, an account manager or a trade advisor uh, allocated uh, who will discuss uh, uh, their needs uh, at the beginning of the project and then together uh, with our research uh, departments uh, we are um, um, trying to offer the best uh, solutions for their business. Um, when entering, just a moment please. Uh, when entering a, a new market, um, it is very important to, to define a strategy and um, uh, this um, could be uh, uh, to enter um, uh, all markets in the same time. Uh, for example, when uh, a company is looking for distributors or just to uh, concentrate on um, uh, one market uh, uh, for uh, technical projects, uh, for in uh, automotive field, for example, or as I mentioned, uh, in uh, steel industry, in uh, advanced engineering, um, or also for um, um, uh, food and drink industry, maybe um, the way uh, the companies uh, uh, choose to, to go is to, to enter the largest market, uh, with the biggest uh, number of uh, consumers and then uh, extended uh, to smaller markets too. Um, the main thing to remember is uh, that we are a team within the region uh, uh, with six locations in these uh, six countries and um, it's very important uh, for you when entering a new market uh, uh, to have a local partner uh, to help you with the introduction um, to local uh, business partners and um, also to have a partner with a large uh, network in the business environment and this is what uh, um, the British uh, uh, business centers and the uh, chambers of commerce uh, uh, can offer you. And uh, the next uh, slide, please, uh, you will find here uh, all our um, uh, contacts uh, in the six countries, as I mentioned. The British Chamber of Commerce in the Czech Republic, uh, located in Prague. The British Business Center in Hungary, in Budapest. The British Polish uh, Business Center um, uh, in uh, Warsaw. The British Romanian Business Center in Bucharest, Romania. British Slovak Business Center in uh, Bratislava, Slovakia, and uh, last but not the least, uh, British uh, Slovenian Chamber of Commerce uh, and uh, uh, British Slovenian Trade Team in uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Thank you, Marie. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you to all our presenters uh, for that tour around the region. Um, just a quick reminder that you can still ask questions. We've had a number of questions come through, so we will run through a few of those now. Um, perhaps uh, the first one to start with um, is there's been a number of questions around EU-funded projects and access to EU-funded projects. Is there scope to tap into EU-funded projects? Um, perhaps we can start with Philip. Uh, I would say that it's not the easiest for a UK SME exporter to directly bid for EU-funded projects. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you can certainly find a local partner and uh, form a partnership and bid together with them. And the other thing is that, that it's very uh, important to look into what, uh, what the EU-funded projects uh, will, will look like, what, what is planned for the next period, because it gives you a very good idea of what are the areas in which uh, there will be substantial uh, funding and then we can help you research the particular projects, the particular opportunities, partnerships that can be formed. 
but just having a look at what's planned in the in the next uh, five years gives you a very good idea what what uh, the main areas will be. So to give a particular example from the Czech Republic, uh, we learned that, that the government is is planning to uh, direct lots of the agricultural uh, EU funded uh, money to uh, to new uh, projects or reconstruction in the area of. Um, live uh, animal uh, fat, so if you have uh, any products or uh, services around this area, this could be a particular good opportunity in the Czech market. Great, thank you Philip. Um, has anybody else got any any points to add to that or should we move on to the next question? Perhaps if I can just add Marilise, I think it's a really good question. There is a huge amount of opportunity out of there. And the British companies are not as good as European companies at accessing the funds that they put into EU structural funding. So just to give you a stat, I'm a lover of stats. For every one euro that the Austrians put into EU structural funds, they get 97 cents back in the form of contracts for their companies. For every pound that the UK puts in, we get 13p back in the form of contracts won for British companies. So we've got a challenge there, and we realise that. Uh, what I would say is for big ticket opportunities, we're working with government for doing the procurement. Uh, that's why we work very closely with UK Trade Investment, we can get access and get insight, uh, the government organisations can. Where there's a will, there's a way, and there's lots of advice out there as to how you can access EU. Great, thanks for that uh, add-on. Um, moving on, there's lots and lots of questions, and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible now. Just to say, if we don't get around to your question, we will be following on uh, uh, offline with you. Um, Paddy, perhaps we can continue with you. We've had a particular question about key opportunities in Poland for engineering and what those look like. I don't know if that's a question you've got an immediate answer to or one you'd like to um, go and think about. Well, that's what partly why I tried to emphasize in the sectors area why it's really important to drill down into the detail. For example, I used to work uh, focusing on energy in the British Embassy in Warsaw. And if you produce a particular diameter of gas pipeline, then you're absolutely quids in because they're going to build over a thousand kilometers of, of, of that pipeline. If you happen to be building different diameters, uh, then you've got a real challenge there. So uh, it's difficult now in a, in, a, in a brief way to give you a top line uh, look down on the engineering opportunity. Poland, like many of these countries, is a big manufacturing country. They still make and do a lot of things in these markets, not just in Poland, but right across the region. Um, so you can look at the automotive supply chain, there's a huge amount of work going on there. You can look at uh, aeronautics, for example, in the, in the southwest of the country or shipyards uh, up in the north. Uh, you name it, there's a lot of doing here. And that's principally because many of these markets, but also principally Poland, are, are form part of the German supply chain. Now, uh, if you're selling goods, uh, manufacturing goods to Germany, then you probably could and definitely should be thinking about how you can enter these markets because they are attuned to uh, British goods and the German supply chain as well. So uh, if the questionnaire wants to get in touch, we can have a look at their specific product, uh, do a competitor price analysis, uh, look at who else is succeeding in the market, look at trade data, uh, speak to experts across our business network and start to form a picture of whether there's opportunity for them. That's great. That sounds like there's, uh, there's lots of information available uh, through you for that. Um, Next question. This is perhaps one to throw out. Uh, you, you guys on the ground will know better who, who should answer this. What mining is undertaken in CEE? The mining, uh, just coming into Slovakia, there's, um, there's quite a few projects here. There's one, um, yeah. one interesting company uh, that we know in the UK that's already out here in a, in a place in Slovakia called Kremnica. And uh, Kremnica is um, very uh, gold mining orientated, the, the Royal Mint was set up in Kremnica and uh, um, there is a particular company uh, in the UK that's actually responsible for this um, project at the moment. So <clears throat> in Slovakia for instance there are opportunities, um, it depends what type of mining of course. Um, again I think as, as you know as we've mentioned across the, the whole region I think you know it's very important to, these, are, these questions obviously just going to touch the surface now but there are opportunities in many different sectors. And I think, for instance, with mining, you know, we've really got to specifically look at the particular company, uh, country and company to see, you know, what would be um, what would be good there. But that's just something in Slovakia. Anybody else have anything in the other countries? Perhaps if I can briefly add, then uh, Poland is a major 
Uh, coal producer, there's a significant coal mining industry here. Poland also does some uranium mining as well, uh, not very much, but, uh, but fairly significant on the world scene. Um, so m mining is a massive issue here, but many of these markets have faced decades of communist c c command and control uh, infrastructure development. Uh, so a lot of the technology processes uh, and the company structures, many of them are either state-owned or former state-owned, both in Poland and around the region, uh, require a lot of help. Uh, and depending on how you look at this sector, it's either an opportunity or a challenge um, because clearly they come with outdated modes of practice of working. Uh, again, as Chris says, you need to look into the detail to see whether your technology or your service or your product is appropriate for our markets. Excellent. Thank you very much. A um, bit more of a general question. Uh, I think, Chris, uh, you touched upon this. Uh, approaching SMEs in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, can can they do work in English? Can they have meetings in English, or would it be better to work with a translator? Yeah, very, very good question. I think this is what we get. We do get this question quite often. Um, I think you know, um, as the good old British, we're not the best at learning foreign languages. Although some of my colleagues here will uh, disagree, but um, I think it's it's really key to make sure that you investigate the area. Um, obviously, the British business centres are here to help you. But, but to be fair, um, I, I really believe that you, you can definitely do your meetings in English. The, the, the top people in the companies, the, you know, the CEOs, the general managers, the people at the top of the, the, the chain as far as management go, are, are all speaking English. Um, I think some of the stats that we had were, uh, especially here in Slovakia, but across the region, you know, the, the education ministers are very keen to see British as the number one language, obviously in the past. Um, you have 40 plus people speaking Russian, you have people between the ages of 30 and 45 maybe speaking German, uh, and uh, from Slovakia for instance, and then uh, now everybody under the age of, I would say, 30 is very good in English. So, you know, these are up to 30 year olds, you've got project managers and people on the ground. But obviously as soon as you move out of the main capital cities, for instance here in Bratislava, if you move out to the east a little bit further, you are going to come across different problems, um, we can help you with that, and I think as uh, when Patrick was mentioning the um, chamber membership, again, we all have translators, we have agencies, we have people working with us that can really help you if you do need that, but I wouldn't be scared about it, um, it's, it's definitely going to help and it's only going to get better from now on, so um, anybody would like to add to that point? Yes, if I may uh, add something. Uh... Um, in Romania, for example, um, uh, many companies understood that uh, working uh, uh, with foreign uh, partners and working for export, uh, they are in touch with, uh, with a lot of foreign com companies and uh, speaking English uh, very well. So we, uh, we uh, had uh, also a very recent uh, case uh, IT company visiting uh, Romania and arranged visits uh, in the country in the construction field uh, and he had uh, no problem in uh, uh, conducting the uh, meetings in English. Uh, and uh, the case studies uh, with, with, uh, I presented earlier uh, with Suzer, so he visited some uh, factories, some uh, manufacturing of, uh, uh, factories and uh, uh, he hadn't any problem uh, to to have uh, discussions in English, uh, so he didn't need uh, translation. So I assume uh, that uh, in business uh, environment, uh, English uh, is uh, essential to uh, in Europe is uh, the main language. So uh, it wouldn't should, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. Can I also just add to that very quickly? Sorry, Marilis, I know we've got a lot of questions. Uh, I think it's really important to understand if you're selling a good a product and you want to sell it indirectly, then it's only really important uh, whether you can have a good working relationship with your proxy. It's their job to make sure they market and access the buyers on your behalf. Uh, if on the other hand you're looking to sell directly, you've got to build a local market language uh, uh, strategy. And that's the same as services as well. Services is a bit unique uh, because if you're looking to deliver services in the local market, then almost certainly, depending on what they are, if it was executive leadership uh, for CEOs, it might be in English, but if it was lean management process improvement, it might have to be in the local language because you're dealing with uh, uh, a wider group of lower educated people. There are no hard and fast rules, but I think Chris and uh, Christina have both pointed out that uh, effectively this is the region which speaks pretty good English. Great, thank you very much to uh, all three of you for, for that input. It, it leads quite nicely into a question which is 
you know, again on communications, but maybe more the public communications. How does the public respond to e-commerce or pre-booking services online? Well, I guess I can I can probably start on that a little bit. Um, as you know, we've put the regional um, platform together, the digital platform, so we we're quite keyed into that. But we do notice that, um, I guess, logging on and, and registering with different events, I guess that's what you're referring to, perhaps something that's happening within the region, trying to, to communicate with different customers. The, the internet bandwidth, I know in Romania, Christina keeps telling me that it's the fastest uh, in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very fast internet speed um, over here in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and I believe that you know, logging on to different types of events or registering is pretty common. We do that, for instance, with our chambers of commerce, all of our chambers of commerce, we registering with different events. If we do have um, a large scale event, for instance, we have a, a Global Entrepreneurs Summit coming up on March 13th here in Slovakia with a lot of British people. Uh, we do actually have an event bright solution that we use, for instance, for registry on that. So obviously we use the larger companies the same as before. So I don't know like that. Kind of answer your question, probably needs to be a little bit more specific, but hopefully that gives you some feedback on that, Marilise. Great, thank you. Um, perhaps we've got time for one more question. Um, the one that's come through is, do your chambers and business centres work with the Enterprise Europe Network, which is the European Commission SME network? And if so, how? Yeah, mate. No. Maybe I can answer that, Marilise, because uh, absolutely we do we work absolutely in partnership with the EN, uh, both in the UK and in our markets. In fact, I know um, Christina and her team there have welcomed the EN on a trade mission recently, uh, and it's our very great pleasure to host um, a group, we hope, of up to 10 EEN companies coming into market uh, in March into Poland as well. So lots of activity there going on, not just with the EEN, also with Chambers of Commerce and UK Trade and Investment. Okay, that's great. We've got a number of questions still to get through, but our time is unfortunately just about up, so we will come back on those questions uh, offline. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers and to each of our presenters. And um, oh, there we go. Um, finally, just if you'd like to register for any of the other webinars in this series, we will be covering a number of world regions. Uh, so uh, today we've got Latin America uh, in an hour and a half. And um, then on Thursday, you'll be able to listen in to Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Um, finally, uh, if you'd like to connect with, if you'd like more information and you'd like to connect uh, with these opportunities and the information that's out there, in terms of supporting you grow your business internationally, uh, you can find the details of your local chamber on exportbritain.org.uk, and you can also access through that um, a wide variety of international trade support, whether it's the government UK trade and investment support, or whether it's British chambers of commerce based overseas in market. Um, and finally, uh, just a quick message to say that uh, a window will pop up at the end of this webinar with just a couple of questions. It would be great if you could fill those in so that we can make sure that we give you the best possible follow-up from this webinar. Uh, I think that's just about it. Finally, if anybody is in London next week, it will be the British Chains of Commerce Annual Conference next Tuesday. Uh, you can register, the link is online there. Um, this will be a really good opportunity to meet a lot of the chambers face to face and also hear from some political and business leaders on uh, the future of, of 